So glad to see you all out this evening, and I encourage you to take out your Bibles and follow along to test the things I have to say to see if it is by God's Word. If we find it to be such, I hope that we can take and apply in our lives that we could all be better servants of God in the future than we have been in the past. If you have any questions about anything I say, bring that to my attention. We'll sit down with nothing but Bible in hand and seek the answers from the Scriptures because that is ultimately the standard by which we're going to be judged. We began several weeks ago a series of lessons on just some basic Bible principles, and we're going to bring that series to a close tonight. We began that series by asking the question, the Bible, is it God's Word? If the Bible is not the Word of God, then anything else we say about it really doesn't matter because it's just like any other book. But if we can conclude that it is indeed the Word of God, then it, then we need to seek to understand it. And so we looked at some evidence of if it is God's Word. We talked about the resurrection that week and how if Jesus truly was raised from the dead, it proved Him the Son of God and therefore His Word is true. And so we looked at the evidence and we talked about the empty tomb and the witnesses. We talked about the change in the apostles, the change in His enemies. We talked about the change in Saul of Tarsus and concluded the resurrection really happened and therefore the Bible is God's Word. We talked about prophecy and all the prophecies that were fulfilled. How Peter Stoner in the book Science Speaks took just eight and said that the odds of one man by chance filling just eight of those was one in ten to the seventeenth power, yet Jesus filled over three hundred of those. That shows the power of prophecy, which proves the Bible to be inspired. Not only the prophecies about Jesus, but the prophecies about about the nations. from We talked about Egypt, we talked about Babylonia, but there were many other nations that it was prophesied of what would happen to them, and so it, it was according to the Scriptures. We talked about the unity of the Bible. It's 66, a compilation of 66 books written over a 1,500 year period by about 40 writers in three different languages, and yet there is no contradiction. There is complete and total agreement and a common theme. We talked about the survival of the Bible. There was the Dark Age Bible burnings, so those who sought to destroy the Word of God. It was Voltaire who said within 50 years the Bible will no longer be discussed among educated people. And yet it is. In the early 1900s, Robert Ingersoll said in 15 years I will have this book in the morgue. And yet we're talking about it today over 100 years later. And then we talked about the fact that it is completely inspired. Not only are the very thoughts inspired, for all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, but the very words are inspired, as 1 Corinthians 2.13 tells us, that it's not words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So then we raise the question, if the Bible is God's Word, does it matter what we believe about it? And so we explored the question of does it matter? And we talked about the story of Nadab, or Cain and Abel, and Nadab and Abihu, and the story of the young prophet out of Judah. And then we talked about those in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and the, those that it says believe the lie. And we saw on each one of those occasions it mattered what they believed, therefore it matters what we believe. And so that's why we need to seek to understand the Bible, that we can seek to understand it, and we need to study it because it ultimately matters what we believe about the Bible and what we practice. So then we raise the question, what's the theme of the Bible? We saw in Lesson 1 there was a complete and total agreement in theme. What is that theme? And so we talked about the fact the Old Testament talks about the Messiah's coming. The Gospels talk about the fact the Messiah was there at that time. And then it talks in the uh, Acts 3 Revelation about the fact that He has already come and He will come again. And then we, last week, we raised the question, what is the plan of salvation in the Bible? We saw it mattered what it believed. What we believe, what then is this plan of salvation in the Bible? How is it that I need to be saved? We begin by understanding the fact that there is a need for salvation, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that sin has separated us from God, not just here and now, and that we cannot worship Him and pray to Him, but ultimately, if unrepented of, will separate us for all eternity in hell. We saw that we are saved by grace, but the grace was conditional. Grace can be conditional, and it is for us. And so we're saved by this conditional grace. So the question was, what were the conditions? So we talked about the plan for the alien sin. They need to hear the Word of God, believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, repent of their sins, confess their faith in Him, and be buried in the waters of baptism. That's what the alien sinner needs to do. And then we ask the question, what is the plan for the erring child of God? They need to repent of their sins, to confess their sins, and to pray for forgiveness. And that was the plan given for the erring child of God. 
But as we bring this series to a close, we want to ask the question about the Bible, what is the church in it? If we go out in the religious world, you go out in, in the religious world, you see all these churches, you just drive around town, you see all different kinds of churches that teach different things and believe different things and practice different things. And yet, while there's all those churches, they all claim that their way is going to lead to heaven. But we know that it matters what we believe about the Bible from lesson number two. So what is it that the Bible teaches about the church? What is this church in the Bible? As we begin to understand and talk about the church that is in the Bible, we need to understand those that are in the church. Go to Acts chapter 8 with me. In Acts chapter 8 and in verse 3, Acts 8 and in verse 3, here we have Saul of Tarsus persecuting the church or making havoc of the church. Look at verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. What he's making havoc of is the church. Now listen. Entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. How is Saul making havoc of the church? Well, Saul isn't going in and tearing down a building somewhere. That's the idea that many people have is that a church is a building, but the church is the people. Saul's not making havoc of the church by tearing down a building somewhere. He's making havoc of the church by entering every house and dragging off the men and women that were members of the church. So it's the people that make up the church. But it's not just any people that make it up. It's those that are saved. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we've had this, this gospel sermon preached by, by Peter. And here they've, there were those that obeyed the gospel back in verse 41. And it said that they were added to those, that, that, that day there were 3,000 souls were added to them. Then you come down in verse 47, it talks about the work that is being done in those previous verses. And in the last half of verse 47, here's how the chapter ends. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Those being added to the church for those that are being saved. Now we're going to draw a distinction in a minute that there's a church in a universal sense and in a local sense. But we need to understand this principle. That people have this idea that you're saved and then you decide later on whether you want to join a church and what church to join. But at the time you are saved, you are then a member of the church. They were added to the church, those being saved. So when one obeys the gospel, they become part of the body of Christ. They become a member of the church. That's those that are making the, the, the church. The church is the people, and it's people that are saved, so that the church is those is all those who are saved. That's what the church is. That's those who make up the church. We need to understand those that make up the church, because it's not just some, some building somewhere, as some paint the idea that here's this building, and the building is the church. That's the building where the church meets, but the church is the people, and it's the people that are saved. Now, that's what those that are in the church are, but that brings us to the next point, that there is but only one church. Again, we talked about earlier, you go out and you, you, you drive around the town and you're not going to have to go for very long before you start finding churches with different names and different practices. But the Bible teaches that there is but one church. Look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Here's where Peter has made his confession about Jesus. Back in verse 16, where he asked about who do men say that I am, and in verse 16, that he asked who they, uh, what do you say, or who do you say that I am, and Peter confessed him. And in verse 17, beginning, he said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. It's important to understand in this text, he says, I will build my church. It's in the singular. He's not talking about I'll build my churches. My church, there was but one. In Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, it's talking about this unity here, backing up in the verse to 
Verse 3, where it talks about keeping the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then there's that list of ones. It begins with, there is one body. Ephesians 4 and in verse 4. And we know that the body and the church are one and the same. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. The fullness of Him who fills all in all. So the body and the church are one and the same. So what that's telling me is, aside from Matthew chapter 16, which he said that he would build his church, it's in the singular, it says in Ephesians 4.4, 4, very specifically, there's one body. And earlier in that same epistle, it said that the body was the church, therefore there is but one church. There's only one true church. You see all these churches out there, but there is but one true church. More about that in a moment. But aside from different churches with different names, and you go around and you say, well, here's, here's the Church of Christ, and over here is a Baptist church and a Methodist church and all that. But we talk about people that we know at other churches. What are we talking about? We need to understand the difference in the universal and the local. The universal church is all who are saved. For example, in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 47, the Lord added to the church... What he's doing is adding those to the universal church that are being saved. That's what's taking place in Acts 2 and in verse 47. When they obey the gospel, they are members of his body. They are part of the universal church. That's what he's talking about. In Matthew 16 and 18, he would build his church. Then on this rock I will build my church. He's talking about the universal church. But then we also have the term church used in a local sense. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we're studying 1 Corinthians on Sunday morning. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as the epistle begins, he says, to the church of God which is at Corinth. There was a church at Corinth. Then he might write to the churches in Galatia. I write to the church at Rome. In Romans chapter 16 and in verse 16, it talks about the churches of Christ greet you. This is the local sense. You see, universally, there is but one church. They believe the same thing. They practice the same thing. And it's all those that are saved. All those in the universal church are all those who have obeyed the gospel and been saved. But the local church is the church at a locality. So there's the church here. You may have moved here from somewhere else and you came from a different church. You should may believe the same thing that you believe now and you practice the same thing there you practice now. They would teach the same things that we teach here. You see, they're teaching that one faith. But you went from one local church to another. But in the end, whether you're here, for those here or those where you may have came from are all members of the universal church. Maybe different local churches, but we're all part of the universal church. We'll talk more about that later on. But then that brings us to this concept of denominationalism. The concept of denominationalism. You see, you have all these churches out here. There are many churches. And you people talk about the denomination. What denomination are you? You may have been asked that question. What denomination are you? What, there's, what is implied by the question is that one is as good as another. That's what this term... When you talk about a denomination, that's what that is. One is as good as another. There is no wrong choice. It doesn't matter whether you go to the Church of Christ or the Baptist Church or the Methodist Church or the Lutheran Church or any of this. It, it, it's the one that you... It's, it, 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 there's no wrong choice. That's the idea of denominationalism. Pick the one you like. That's what denominationalism implies. They teach all these different things, but you can pick whatever one you like. One's just as good as another, and there's no wrong choice. We need to, to help us understand the idea of how denominationalism is used in the religious world. Let's understand the fact that it used to be used to money. You probably have not gone into a bank lately and handed them a check, and you know, a hundred dollar check, and then ask you, what denomination? And if they had, the first thing that probably popped into your mind was, they're asking me where I go to church. But the domination is the term we use for money. So we have different divisions of bills. We have ones and fives and tens and twenties and fifties and hundreds. 
Now, here's where this concept of denominationalism becomes important. If I take a $100 check and I go to the bank and they ask me what I want the bills in, if I want to get it in $101 bills or 25s or 1010s, 520s, 250s or 1100, guess what? I have $100 when all is said and done. Maybe I would prefer to carry it in fives. But if you went with a $100 check, you prefer to have it in the 250s. Somebody else says, well, I want it in, in 520s. Guess what? There's no wrong choice. You know what you have? You have $100. I have $100. The other person has $100. And then we all have $100. That's what denominationalism is. So the concept of denomination in the religious world is, okay, well, you go to this church that you like, and I go to this church that I like, and even though we all practice different things, in the end, we're all saved and we're all okay. See, so this is the concept of denominationalism. Here's God's people, the saved. And the concept of denominationalism says that in that we could have the Seventh-day Adventists, the Church of the Nazarenes, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Church of God, the Church of Christ, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church. And in the end, that all of those are included in the same. That's the idea of denominationalism. There may be different practices, different doctrines among those, but in the end, the idea of denominationalism is all is okay. But that's not fitting with Scriptures. For there is one church... According to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, one body, and the body is the church. Jesus only promised one, and He built only one. And so this idea of denominationalism says there's all these churches, but that's not fitting with Scripture. There can't be all these different churches that practice different things because it was only promised that there would be one church. So, we know that the church is the people. And the church is the people that are saved, according to Acts 2 and verse 47. Not only is the church those that are saved, we know that Jesus promised to build only one. He built only one. Yes, there are there may be many local churches, but the many local churches are those that believe and practice the truth. Those members are members of the universal church. And we know the concept of denominationalism does not fit with Scripture. You can't just look and say one's as good as another and pick whatever you like. But then that brings us to this. What is the true church? So let's talk about the characteristics of the church. If we want to identify what the church of the New Testament is, somebody says, I want to make sure that I am attending at the church that is the church of the New Testament. Then we need to know what the characteristics of that church are. Then we know how to identify the church of the New Testament. When we talk about the characteristics, we need to understand the characteristics matter. Again, this idea of denominationalism and what everybody's thinking is you just pick what you like and in the end, if we believe different things, we can all be saved. You pick what you like over here, I'll go over here where I like what they teach, somebody else may go over here and another person over here, but in the end, we're all saved. We know that there's only one church. But then, how do we know what the, church, the one church is? Maybe now I just like, I'll choose this one because that's what I like, that's what I think is the one church. We've got to find the church that fits the characteristics. The characteristics matter. See if we can illustrate that point. Suppose you were looking for a lost boy. Suppose you were to go to Walmart after services and a mother comes running up to you panicking and says, My son is lost. Can you help me find him? Well, if she says, my son is lost, can you help me find him? You're going to want to know, what's the characteristics? What, give me something, some description of the boy. I need to know what the boy's like. So she tells you, okay, I'm oh, sorry. I, here's the description. He's about eight, he's eight years old. He's around 65 pounds, about 46 inches tall. His name is Billy. He has blonde hair and he has blue eyes. That's the description the mother gives you of her son. So you go out and you, and you search for a boy. And you're searching through and you say, okay, well, I found the boy. He's about eight years old. He, he's, he, he looks like he might be about 65 pounds, about 46 inches tall. He has blonde hair and he has blue eyes, but his name is Robert. And you bring him back to the mother and you say, here's your son. She's going to say, that's not my son. What do you mean he's not your son? He's eight years old, he's 65 pounds, he's 46 inches tall, he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. But he's got the wrong name. I told you my son's name was Billy, you brought me a boy named Robert. Oh, okay, so you take Robert back, find, take him back where you found him, go search for another boy. Now you come back and you say, i got a boy named Billy. Here you go, here's your son. 
She looks at you like you're crazy. You brought her a 16-year-old boy named Billy. That's not my son. Yeah, he's got blonde hair and blue eyes. But he's 16 years old. He's more like 65 inches tall. And 165 pounds. That's not my son. He doesn't fit the description. Okay, you go out and you look again and you come back and now you find a boy who's 8 years old. He's 65 pounds. He's 46 inches tall. His name is Billy. He has blonde hair. He has blue eyes. You take her back and she says, that's my son. You see... You would think when you're looking for a lost boy that all the characteristics matter. When you come back, the mother doesn't say, well, okay, yeah, he, his name is wrong, but he's got most of the description. I'll take him. It's okay. But he needs to fit the description, the characteristics of the boy to a T. Just because a church fits some of the characteristics that are given in the New Testament does not make it a scripturally right church. The church needs to fit all the characteristics. It is, you know, you think the boy, it's important the boy meets all the characteristics in name. The church that you attend must meet all the characteristics of the church of the New Testament. If you look at the church that you, if you look at it and you're saying, well, the church that I attend does not meet all the characteristics of the New Testament, then, then we've got a problem. Oh, it's got the right name, but it's got the wrong description about it. It's got the wrong characteristics. Or it's got the, the, Right name, or the wrong name, but it's got the right character. It's got to meet all those things. Just like the boy Robert didn't suffice just because he fit the characteristics. Just because the boy named Billy didn't fit, just because the boy didn't fit that was 16 years old, but just because his name was Billy. Now, that brings us to this question again. We talk about the characteristics of the church. What are the church's characteristics? Number one, it was founded by Christ. Look at Matthew 16, 18 again. In Matthew chapter 16 and in verse 18, And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The true church, the church of the New Testament was founded by Christ. So you go through, and we'll talk later on about some of these divisions further and how we ended up with so many churches. But when you go and you're, and you're looking at the church and you find out that the church that you're a part of was founded by some man somewhere, not by Christ, then you're in the wrong church. It's got to be the church that was founded by Christ, the church that Christ built. Not only is it to be founded by Christ, it began in 33 A.D. in Jerusalem. In Acts chapter 2, we have the establishment of the church there on the day of Pentecost. It's 33 A.D. And it took place in the city of Jerusalem. So somebody's attending services somewhere and they look at the church they're attending and they find out that not only was it established by some man, but it was established you know, in 1500 in some foreign country or founded over in the United States some, somewhere, then guess what? It's not the church of the New Testament because it needed to be founded by Christ and it began in Jerusalem in 33 AD. So it has to have the right founder. It has to begin at the right time. And be founded in the right place. It has to have the right name. Just like when you took that boy, if you took that boy back, whose name was Robert, instead of Billy, it, it made a difference. It needs to have a scriptural name. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in verse 2, Paul greeted the church of God which is at Corinth. In Romans chapter 16 and in verse 16, he said the churches of Christ greet you. That gives us two names there, the church of God and the church of Christ. Those names are given. So it needs to have the right name, either the Church of God or Church of Christ. Be founded by Christ, begin in Jerusalem in 33 AD. It has no universal organization. The, the denominations have, have headquarters somewhere. So if somebody asks you, where is the headquarters for your church? If you're looking at where you attend services and you say, well... The headquarters is, and you can name some physical location the headquarters is, then you're in the wrong church. The headquarters of the, the church, is, there is no universal organization where people that are, that are, all the people that are saved know there's just one universal organization that you can go to, and that's where they can all gather together to meet, and there's, that's the headquarters. It's not like these, the, Nomination where you have one place that may be the headquarters. 
But in the local church, it is organized with elders and deacons. Look at Philippians 1. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops, that's the elders, and deacons. With the bishops and deacons. And so the local church needs to be organized with, with elders and deacons. Now, I know there are times that a church may not have men that are qualified to serve, but in terms of the local church, when there are qualified men, that's the organization of the local church. It has elders and deacons, and to include the fact that it has members, because he greeted all the saints and the bishops and the deacons. Here's what we know so far. The church of the New Testament was founded by Christ. It began in 33 AD in Jerusalem. The names given in the Scriptures are Church of God and Church of Christ. There is no universal organization and locally organized with elders and deacons. And then it needs to have the right works. And here's what those works are. 1 Timothy 3.15, the work of evangelism. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in verse 15, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of God, the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. We have the work to evangelize. The church needs to be, needs to be evangelizing, to be teaching those. It's the work of evangelism. The work of edification. In Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, and in verse 16, for whom the whole body, being joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, listen, listen, causes the growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The work of the church is to evangelize, but it's also to edify. We need to be edified when we're gathered together. Lift it up. And then in 1 Timothy 5, 16, there's limited benevolence. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, he's dealing with with the, the widows indeed. He's dealing in First Timothy chapter 5 and in verse 16 with the widows indeed. We know from some other passages that we've seen they can help those that are the needy saints. But it's limited. It's important to understand that oftentimes we talk about evangelism and edification and benevolence, but the benevolence is limited. That word limited is very important because the church can only help those that are saints. Benevolence is limited. So when you're going through the characteristics and you find a church that is partaking in some social activity, they have a basketball team, and you look at your thing, well, is that evangelism? I can't see how playing basketball is teaching. Is is, is that edification? Is it really edifying to be running back and forth on the court and shooting hoops? And how can that fall under limited benevolence? You find a church participating in something in the sharing of a common meal. Where does that fall? That's neither evangelism, edification, nor limited benevolence. Look at the church and they participate in something other than these works. Then they're going outside the teachings of the Bible. That's not the church of the New Testament. Here's the description of the church of the New Testament one more time. It was founded by Christ. It began in 33 AD in Jerusalem. The names Church of God and Church of Christ are given. There is no universal organization. It is locally organized with elders and deacons. And this works, and the only works it is authorized to do are evangelism, edification, and limited benevolence. That is the characteristics of the church of the New Testament. So we know that the church is made up of the people, and it's the people that are saved. We know there is but one church, and the concept of denominationalism is not true. We know now the characteristics of the church that are given. We know they're important, and we know what they are. But why do we have so many churches? If Jesus founded only one church, why can I drive down the road and see all these different kinds of churches on my way home? Let's talk about the departures from the church. We understand first and foremost, the departures were foretold. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 
and in verse 3, there were those that believed the day of the Lord was coming suddenly. It was going to be coming soon, very soon. And so some of those at Thessalonica had quit working, and here's what Paul told them. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that is the, the, the Lord's return, will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. It was already told back in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, there would be departures, the falling away. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. And so he talks about there that the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. It was foretold back in Timothy and in 2 Thessalonians that there would be departures of the game. We need to understand that departure was not something that was sudden, but it was a very slow process. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And in verse 1. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. Now, we can take and make application of that to the individual. There is application of that, but we need to understand that a departure, whether by an individual or in the case where there were many departures and the falling away that came in all these religious bodies we have today, is something that is not, that is not sudden, but it's gradual and slow. That's drifting away. Let's see if we can illustrate that real quick. You go out fishing, if you cast your line and you're just sitting in your boat, or you, and, 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 Slowly your boat begins to move. And you don't realize the boat's really moving as you sit there. It's not something, it's so gradual and so slow that you don't even realize you're moving. But if you were to sit there for an hour or two and you look up and realize that, you know, I began over near this area where I could see the land this close and now look how far away I am. That's, that's, that's quite a bit of change. What happened was not something sudden, it was a slow drift. You slowly drifted away from where you were. That's what we're talking about with the departures. The departures were not like one day there was one church, and the next day here are all these different kinds of churches that we have, but it was a slow and gradual process. Here's how that process was taking place. The church was organized with elders. And so the idea was that of the elders, you should have... Take one man from each of these congregations, each of the elders, take one man and make him a presiding elder. They called this man the bishop. So originally you were organized with elders, as the scriptures would teach, and they decided to make one elder over the other elders, and they called this presiding elder the bishop. Well, then they decided to have this group get together of, of bishops get together down here. So now you have the elders, and you take one elder, one man out of each of these elderships, and he's a bishop, and all the bishops get together. And then each group of bishops chooses a man who's a presiding bishop, and they call him the cardinal. So now over here we have a group of cardinals, which the cardinals are the presiding bishops from all the groups of bishops, which was made up of the presiding elders. And now we choose one of these men of cardinals, and they call this man the pope. He's the presiding cardinal, they call him the pope. And you see, it wasn't like one night we went, One night that the departure started and here you had elders and the next day the Pope was there. It's a slow, took many years process where slowly but surely they just drifted farther and farther away. So you went from having elders to a presiding elder called a bishop and this group of bishops, they eventually decided to add the cardinals and they chose a presiding cardinal called the Pope. And it was a slow, very gradual process. It wasn't something that happened overnight. And so it's a lot harder to notice things when they're taking place slowly. Just like you don't notice the boat is moving as you sit there and it slowly moves farther and farther away till you realize that you're a lot farther away from where you stopped. That's the same thing that's happening here. It's a lot harder to notice the things as you slowly move. People become more and more used to it. If somebody suddenly came in and changed everything just like that, people would notice but as it slowly took place and people began to follow, the departures continued. Now, 
Let's get an idea of some of the timeline of departures because that's how we end up with the, what we know as the Roman Catholic Church. But here's the timeline of the departures. Going back here to... We'll, we'll zoom in here. Going back here, this is 30 to 33, depending on uh, who you ask. Somewhere from about 30 to 33 A.D., um, is the founding of the church. It's when Christ died and the church was founded. So here we have the church of Christ. Then remember we had the churches had elders and then slowly the elders, they chose a presiding elder called the bishop. This is happening slowly and then they choose over time a presiding bishop called the cardinal and then choose the presiding cardinal they call the pope. That's happening slowly and then we have full-blown Roman Catholicism. So here we have the Roman Catholic Church. But then we come on further down the line and we have down here the Reformation that takes place. And when this Reformation movement takes place, this is where we talk of men like Martin Luther and the 95 Theses and all this. This is taking place during the Reformation movement and slowly but surely we start to break off into more and more religious bodies. So we started with one church back here a minute ago founded in 33 A.D., And then slowly over time, the Catholic Church became more prominent. But then as you move over here, then the Reformation movement begins to take place. Then you have those that split off and go this way under the Baptist, and then the Presbyterians. You have United Brethren that eventually split off of the Presbyterians and Congregational. Down here you have the Episcopal Americans. Over here you have the Lutherans. Eventually we added the Methodists in 1739. And you see when these dates, by the way, are taking place, 1530, 1609, 1739, 1608... 1536, 1611 is when all these things are taking place. Well after 33 AD. So it was a very slow process that took over a thousand years before we ended up coming to see the churches we have today. And now there are many more. But it's a slow and gradual process where people slowly but surely departed from the truth and then you have one church and then those split off, then many split off from that church and you end up with all these different religious bodies that you have today. That's how we go from being one, from having one true church to all these that are teaching what is false today. Slowly but surely they drifted away from the truth. So we've seen those that are in the church. Those that are in the church are the people, it's the people that are saved. Church is not the building, but the, but those that are saved. There's one church in the universal sense. There may be many local churches, but there is one universal church and the concept of denominationalism does not fit with that. We saw the fact of the characteristics of the church. What does the church have to look like? We talked about the characteristics in its founder, its work, that when it was founded, and, and some others. And then we talked about the departures. But let's finish our, our lesson in our series this evening by talking about life in the church. Somebody says, okay. You're studying through with them. They've gone through, they're, they're hearing this, they've understood that somebody's obeyed the gospel. Now the question may be raised. What's the one true church? They now understand there's one true church. The church needs to fit the characteristics. But how do I need to live? What's the life like in this church? How do I need to live? Well, number one, we need to understand that we are commanded to assemble and worship. We are commanded to assemble and worship. In John chapter 4, verse 24, God is a spirit and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. There's a command to worship. They must worship Him. But Hebrews chapter 10 And a passage well known to all of us, Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 25, "...not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching." I think there are several key aspects we need to understand about life in the church. Life in the church requires assembly and worship. First of all, it requires assembly. If you want to worship God, you need to be to assemble with those who are worshiping Him. Hebrews 10.25 Do not neglect the assembly. Do you know, if you've gone through and you're listening to this, you've obeyed the gospel and all this, but you decide not to assemble, you violated the command of God. The requirement for life in the church is to assemble. But then it's not just simply that we assemble, but we worship when we assemble. We need to understand the worship that is offered must be sincere. God is a spirit. And those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Oftentimes we talk about the characteristics and we'll talk in a minute about the proper acts of worship that need to take place. 
But we need to understand it's not just the proper act. When he talks about spirit and in truth, that is worshiping God in the right way with the right attitude. So we can assemble together and be here every service, but if our service is not sincere, then it is not acceptable to God. Life in the church demands, being a part of the church demands, I assemble and worship God sincerely. It requires us to edify one another. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 19, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, we're edifying one another. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16 that we saw earlier, that when every part does its share for the growth and the edification of the body, we edify one another when we assemble and worship together. But it's not just this assembly and worship, it's sincere worship, it's, it's us edifying one another, and it has to have the proper acts. Worship must have the proper acts. We talked about the characteristics of the church a minute ago. And the church needs to be that which was founded in 33 AD by Jesus in Jerusalem. And we fit all those descriptions. But the church not only needs to fit those characteristics, it must, the worship that there, there must be of the right acts. It needs to require singing. In Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 19, it says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Our worship requires singing. It requires prayer. In Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 42, and going through the end of that text where we saw earlier the statement about those added to the church, beginning at verse 42, is talking about the, the early church there. What's taking place? It's talking about the growth of the early church. And here's what it says of them in verse 42. Those that obeyed the gospel, about 3,000 in verse 41, were added to them. And they, that's the church, that's those who had obeyed the gospel, those that were added to them in verse 41. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. So we need to partake in prayer. Prayer needs to be a part of our worship. They used to observe the Lord's Supper. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, they observe the Lord's Supper. But not only Acts 20 and verse 7, here in verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, there was the breaking of bread that took place in Acts 2, 42. The apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread. That's talking about the Lord's Supper taking place here in Acts 2 and in verse 42. We partake of the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. You know, from Acts 20 and verse 7, is to be on the first day of the week. We give. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we'll be there in a few weeks. 1 Corinthians 16, concerning the collection of the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. If there be no collections when I come. So when they assemble on the first day of the week, and here they are, and they're singing songs of praise, and they're praying to God, and they're partaking of the Lord's Supper, that's when you get... It's also, when we assemble together, we preach. Look at Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Acts 20 and verse 7. Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message unto midnight. There's preaching taking place. When they came together to break bread, that's when they're partaking of the Lord's Supper, there was preaching taking place. That tells me that not only is the Lord's Supper important, but so is listening to the preaching. They came together for the breaking of bread. But not only did they come together to break bread, they listened to the message that was preached to them. So it needs to have the proper acts of singing, of prayer, of observing the Lord's Supper, of giving and of preaching. That's what life in the church demands. Assembly and worship, the right kind of worship with the right attitude. But finally, it requires the fear of God. There's two components of fear. There is respect and awe. In Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 28, in Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 28, it says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, 
Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. There's reverence there. A reverence in all, some translations say. There's a sense of this respect in all taking place. There's also the, the of being afraid. We just went through 1 Samuel 11 not long ago, but if you remember in 1 Samuel chapter 11, this is where Saul is getting ready to go out to battle in 1 Samuel chapter 11. And as he's getting ready to go to battle, they take the yoke of oxen and cut it into pieces, and they send out a messenger to tell the people that whoever does not go out with Saul and Samuel to battle, so it shall be done to his oxen. Can you imagine as you're standing there that somebody knocks on your door and you open it up and they're holding this piece of meat, this bloody piece of meat from this ox, this, the, the yoke of oxen, and they say to you, whoever does not go out to, to, with Saul and Samuel to battle, so shall be done to his oxen. You'd be afraid. What's going to happen? Because oftentimes that was a sense of livelihood for many or how they, they would need those oxen for the plowing of the fields or whatever they needed to do to provide for themselves. You'd be afraid. And so were they. It says, and the fear of the Lord fell on the people. That's the sense of them being afraid. And here in 1 Samuel 11 and in verse 7. So there's two components of fear. Fear can cause us both respect and awe, but it also causes us to be afraid. Be afraid of displeasing God. Be afraid of what happens when you do not follow His commands. We need to understand that these two components of fear, the respect and awe and the fear, Calls us to obey God. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and in verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 13 and in verse 4. It says, You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice. There's fear and obedience there together. You shall serve Him and hold fast to Him. There's fear and obedience. Fear calls us to obey. We need to understand that's what the Lord requires of us. Turn just a few pages over to Deuteronomy chapter 10. In Deuteronomy chapter 10 and in verse 12. Deuteronomy 10 and in verse 12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? What does God require? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Fear God, fear of God is required of us. Right there alongside love and obedience. The fear of God is required. In fact, it is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and 13 and 14. Let's hear the conclusion of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Really, the word duty is added there. It really is the whole of man. Fearing God and keeping His commandments is what makes man whole. That's what he's saying here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. So we need to understand, not only does life in the church require us to assemble and to worship God in the right way, it requires us to live in the fear of God. Both the respect and the fear component of that word fear. And so it will cause us to obey. It is, the Lord requires it of us, and it is the whole duty of man. We bring this series to a close. Here's the conclusions we have to reach from what we've seen. We understand from what we have seen, the Bible is indeed the Word of God. For all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We know from 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12, that it matters what we believe. Those that believe the lie will perish. We studied about Jesus in the third lesson and about how He was going to come in the Old Testament, how He was there in the Gospels and He was coming again and He, is, he had come and will come again. And we saw that in the time that He was here, He said that His Word is the standard by which we will be judged. So if I know the Bible is the Word of God, it matters what I believe about it, and the words of Jesus, the words of the, that are recorded in the Scriptures are the words by which I am going to be judged. Therefore, here's what I must do. Somebody is here who has never obeyed the gospel. They need to follow the plan of salvation for the alien sinner. The plan God has laid out that if you've heard the word, you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that you would be willing to repent of your sins, 
to acknowledge your faith in Him and be buried in the waters of baptism to rise and walk in the newness of life. And then you're joined to the church. You're a member of the church. You're added to the number. It's Acts 247. Or for those that have fallen away to be restored. And then I need to understand that I must join the, the one church of the New Testament. And that takes place when I obey the gospel. That I become part of that universal church. And then I seek to join a local body that is doing what is described in God's Word. That is the church of the Bible. If you're here this evening, why would you not join? And you never obeyed the gospel, why would you not join that church? Become a member of the universal church by obeying the gospel. If you've heard and you believe, repent of your sins, confess your faith, and be buried in the waters of baptism. If you're here and you've become a member of that church, but you say, I've not lived in the fear of God as I should. I've not followed His commands. Then acknowledge that, repent of that, and pray to God for forgiveness, and you will be forgiven. But no matter your need, if we can assist you this evening in any way, would you not come forward as together we stand and as we sing?